Being out in the garden and being involved in all the different sorts of life are soothing. Birds soothe us. Water soothes us. There's rosemary. I mean, clearly we could do some pruning, some pinching on that. So we're having chicken for dinner. I want to get some of that out onto my chicken. So just, you know, nip, nip, pinch, trim. Don't hesitate. It'll just keep growing. There's three key elements for successful worm composting, air, moisture and uh, temperatures. So the whole thing is just a very tight clay ball that's inside. Uh, if you miss the moss on the outside um, and then very gently water it from time to time, it will hold a lot of the moisture on its own and it becomes almost its own ecosystem. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Semkew. Well, welcome to The Zoomer. Thank you. We've finally sprung into spring. What better time to start thinking about your garden? Whether you're digging in for the first time or you've hoed a row or two, there's a lot to know before you begin. Today, we'll be discussing some basic fundamentals to help you get gardening in the right direction, both indoor and out. At the round table, I'm joined by horticulturists and landscape designers whose tips and demos will get your green thumb revved up for the growing season. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. If it's true what they say, to nurture a garden is to feed not just the body, but the soul. So if you're afraid to get a little dirty or you don't have a green thumb, here are a few reasons why everyone needs a garden. Number one, dirt makes us happy. Turns out, soil contains a natural antidepressant that stimulates serotonin production and helps lift the spirits. Two, gardening improves our health. Homegrown fruits and veggies are higher in nutrients than their long-traveled cousins. Three, you'll save mounds of money. One estimate says that for every $50 a family puts towards gardening supplies and seeds, they'll produce an estimated $1,250 of food. And four, it's picture perfect. A house flowing with flowers is pleasurable to the eye and soothing to the soul. So it's no wonder gardening is a top five activity for baby boomers. Marjorie, I have to ask, we just saw it on the screen. Of course, uh, gardening is consistently reported as having significant health benefits, but especially for older adults. So what is it about that gardening that contributes to sort of healthy aging and, long and longevity? I'm the example. <laughs> uh, I have been gardening for most of my life. I'm 80 now. And it is the gardening that got me here. It was certainly not the drinking, the smoking, <laughs> fooling around, things like that, or children particularly. But somehow my, ch my garden got me through almost all of the crises of my life. And this is where people keep forgetting how important this is. Uh, the, the idea that you have to study to garden is probably right, but you have to be in the garden and you have to use your hands. And this is, this is incredibly important because it keeps everything together. Mm -hmm. So if your brain is working by reading about it, by looking at things, by examining, by research, your body is also following through. And when you get too old, like I am, you hire really good looking <laughs> young people, <laughs> male and female. That'll help reduce and stress. It really <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think you get out there. You get oh, out I get out there too. all the time. You're not yes. just yelling at them. You're actually getting dirty. No, no, I, I, know I do. It. I do. <laughs> I do what I can, and I'm very smart about what I can't. Yeah. And it's great for our physical health too. As you know, you're a landscaper, Sean. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes, I mean, it comes from two sides. You have to be careful with how you use your body. A friend of mine says, figure out what you can lift and then lift half of that. And, and I say, if you have to lift with your knees, not your back or whatever, then get some help. You know, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, it, it's being out in the garden and being involved in all the different sorts of life are soothing. Birds soothe us, water soothes us. It is both physically good because you're actually working and it's so nice to get out in the garden at this time of year. And it's also mentally good for you, which is amazing. Sarah, you went from a landscaper to a florist. Why is that? 
Uh, this way I get it year-round, opposed to the Canadian winters where you're stuck in the dark reading magazines. Absolutely. Um, I honestly have to admit that since starting the shop, I no longer get those winter blahs. I, I'm mm. surrounded by blooms and plants and flowers all day, every day. Mm. And just the creative energy of my team as well is, is just such a... It invitalizes you. It just makes you feel so good about yourself. You mentioned the climate. I mean, gardening in Canada, of course, presents such unique challenges because of sort of the cold weather and the, and the short growing season. Uh, so then how do we know when to start? Charlie? So, well, you can, I garden year-round, yeah. of course, inside in the winter. Um, but, you know, when it comes to growing, and we'll talk a bit more about growing edibles, for example. Mm -hmm. Some of those we can go out once we're warm enough and the soil is thawed and it's warmed up. And we can just put seeds into the ground. But some seeds we start indoors. Even way back early January, things like geraniums are started you know, from seed months in advance in order to get flowers mm -hmm. uh, in the spring. I started this past weekend. I was out uh, cutting things down to six inches so that you leave homes for the bees. I take all those sticks and I set them aside so the creepy crawlies can come out, the good creepy crawlies and I suppose the bad ones. And then I take everything and I mulch it up on my little itty bitty bit of grass on my boulevard and I put it right back on. So it's easy and it's low carbon footprint, which is good. And you're also preserving all the life that's there. And it's just so nice to get your hands in the ground. That and it's a great time for pruning. It's a great time for pruning, yeah. But I do have a question for you, Sean, actually, and before we wrap, people are always afraid to go outside, especially if they, there's a fear that there may be frost coming, it may be cold. When's the best time to plant a tree? Fall is a really good time to plant a tree because it starts to get its roots in the ground in the fall, and it does, believe it or not, grow a little bit through the whole winter, and then it comes out in the spring. After the leaves have all fallen off is the best time, and it's going to wake up in the spring and never know it's been anywhere else. It's going to, oh, it's lovely here where I've always been. So, so right so, before it gets cold. Yes. Yeah, in the yeah. fall, because the soil's nice and warm in the fall. Yes. And roots love warm soil because roots grow in warm soil. Whereas in the spring, when everybody still frantically gets out in the garden, the soil is so cold, we're putting all these things in the, in the soil and the plants are just going, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Until this place warms up, I'm just sitting here. And they can sit there. I mean, as long as it's thawed, we can get out in the garden but it doesn't mean things are growing yet. We still need that warmth to build up in the soil. And then it's also about aftercare watering. Uh, you have to be very careful, especially with drought tolerant plants. We're putting more focus on that to use less water. For the first year, you have to water drought tolerant plants a lot more. Got it. All right, well, when we come back, we'll get our hands dirty with Charlie Dobbin and later a special gift giveaway for our audience. Don't go away. Big wind, big rain, butterflies do not like it. They need to hide in under foliage or they'll, they'll hide out in a little house like this, hung in your garden, about four feet off the ground in a sunny location. Darren Maharaj takes a look at the top garden trends for 2018 and shows you how to bring the latest looks into your backyard. Well, we're here at Terra Greenhouses in Waterdown, Ontario to check out the latest in gardening trends for the season. And here to give us a helping hand is Zimmer Radio's very own garden guru, Charlie Dobbin. Hey Darren, I've pulled together some really cool stuff here in the greenhouse. Just want to show you in preparation for spring planting. Okay, edibles. Edibles are still trendy, whether it's herbs and little pots or something as wonderful as a tropical lime tree. Grow it on your balcony. As long as you've got lots of sun, these things will do well. Love it. The number one thing that I get calls to the radio show about are hydrangeas. Spring is a lovely time for hydrangeas, but how do you make them blue? Everybody loves the blue. This is what we use. Aluminum sulfate to acidify the soil will give us the purples and blues on the hydrangea. And pollinators. Pollinators are super trendy. Put a little house out for some of the pollinators. Bees, particularly our native bees, will nest in here. Your only job is to hang it up in a little bit of shade and once a year clean it out so that it's fresh to go every spring. And guess what? Wasps. Some of us get inundated with wasps at the end of every season. So be preemptive. Get something like this, a fake wasp nest, out now in the spring and no wasp is going to make a nest when they see this because they think it's a competition. And my final item is kind of an old-fashioned plant, the dahlias. They've been around forever, but notice this is a dinner plate dahlia. Of course, it's available in a tuber at this time of year, but believe it or not, this tuber will grow over a meter tall, up to four feet tall, and the flowers are truly 
the size of dinner plates. For more great gardening tips, be sure to tune in to Charlie's Radio Show or you can listen online at zoomerradio.ca. Here at Terra Greenhouses in Waterdown, Ontario, I'm Darren Maharaj for Zoomer News. Charlie Dobbin, host of The Garden and Home Show on AM 740 Zoomer Radio is here. Charlie, let's get started. We're ready to plant. How do we get started with, well, let's start with seedlings. Well, of course, because it all starts with the seeds. We can buy little plants or we can start seeds. Now, we can use soil, like I see a seed starting mix, or this is a very cool little thing I want you to add some water to. It's a pellet. Mm -hmm. You go ahead and pour some water onto this little pellet. It's made out of core. Core is coconut fiber. Now, why coconut fiber? Well, these used to be peat pellets. And peat pellets, yeah, just let it go because it's gonna, just gonna blow up right before our very eyes. So it's gonna absorb all that moisture and then it's gonna be a, a nice little planting pod, if you will. We'll just choose whatever seeds we'd like to plant read the package to find out how deep to plant them and get those under some nice lights and into a good environment and they will grow very nicely. Interesting. Now, how long does this process take? Well, it, I thought it was going to go faster than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll move on and come back. It, it will blow up in the meantime. <laughs> okay, so once we've put the seeds inside, how, how many seeds can go in a little pot like that? So, never just do one. Because if your one doesn't germinate there, you've just wasted all that time and energy. Always, I always like to plant two or three into okay. each one of these little peat pellets, or in this case, core pellets. And how far apart should they be going? Well, you'll see once this blows up, there will be an opening right in the center. So you'll just drop, pop three little seeds very close together right into the center. Mm -hmm. Then you'll watch and see what happens. If all three grow, you'll choose the strongest, and you'll go in there with your little manicure scissors, and you'll cut out the weaker two. Okay. Never pull them out because you do all this root disturbing and damage the, the one you're trying to keep. So what's this this device here? Well, this is just a really cool uh, little gizmo that I saw and I thought I'd bring it and show you. It is a little hydroponic system, so it's got LED lights. Um, there are planting pods, and so it comes, almost looks like, you know, the, the coffee pods that we, we buy. But this is a pre-done uh, little pod of soil, nutrient, and seeds. In this case, it's basil seeds. Mm -hmm. And they'll sit right in, uh, we'll take the lid off, click into position, water, and the, you water every two, three weeks. And how long, how long would it take before they're I, able, able to be harvested? I bet you you're harvesting there in a couple weeks, two weeks, yeah. three weeks at the most, and you're pinching, right? Just pinching the tips. The more you pinch the tips, the bushier the plants will get. So with herbs, we rarely just cut them out and, and destroy. We just constantly are harvesting and constantly keep them going as long as we can. Now, speaking of harvesting, how do we know when a plant or, or edible is able to be harvested? Well, okay, what do you think about this? Do you think that's ready to, to do some harvesting? I think so, yes. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Sniff it. Rosemary. You got it. <laughs> so there it is. There's rosemary. I mean, clearly we could do some pruning, some pinching on that. Yep. So we're having chicken for dinner. I want to get some of that out onto my chicken. So just, you know, nip, nip, pinch, trim. Don't hesitate. It'll just keep growing. What are some of the other edible plants that you've, that you've brought? Well, I brought a little bit of parsley. And of course, even the, oh, well, here's some strawberries that are still very young. There's five plants in the pot. Okay. So that obviously doesn't stay like that. That's a take it home, separate it into five other bigger pots or into the ground. Okay. But strawberries are so easy to grow. Everybody loves strawberries. And pansies. Have you ever eaten pansies? You can eat those. You can eat the flowers. Yeah, absolutely. And you can uh, put them on your salad, I suppose. Well, if my daughter <laughs> put some on, on the Easter salad and everybody went, oh, they're so pretty, but nobody ate them. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> it's like, such a good idea, but I said, next time she's got to take the petals and break them up and then people be forced to eat them. <laughs> now, one of the questions I'm sure a lot of members in our audience will have is how to control for pests, bugs, aphids, mm -hmm. slugs. What advice can you give us? Happy plants. Happy plants don't have problems. So number one, good soil. Mm -hmm. So make sure your soil is, you know, the right soil, it's been well amended, it's healthy, it's fertile, it's well drained, all those important things. Put the right plant in the right place. So obviously a sun-loving plant goes into the sun and shade-tolerant plants can go into lower light. So start with kind of those kinds of basics. You won't have problems. It's when plants are under stress or they're very unhappy, wrong place, bad environment for one reason or another, they're sending invisible signals out and all kinds of pests and diseases just hone right in on stressed out plants and they do 
they are often attacked in that situation. How about when we're planting outdoors? Uh, how do you control for raccoons or squirrels or, frankly, slugs for that matter? Yeah. Last season, 2017, yeah. was a huge. It was the year of the slug. Uh, my sister in law told me she put out eggshells. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient? Is that a great method of controlling for those types of things? Well, if you really crush them up fine and you make a real point of encircling all your susceptible plants with those crushed eggshells, it'll make a difference because the slugs are crawling along and they lacerate their little bellies on the sharp, um, you know, obviously, <laughs> eggshells, and their liquids all ooze out and they die. But um, something that works very well, I know, I, I never feel bad about killing slugs, trust me. <laughs> There's some, some things I just feel a little bad about, but not slugs. Um, the, um, but one of the things that really works is the uh, household ammonia. Okay. One part ammonia, ten parts water in a mister bottle, and mist the surface of the soil or moisten the surface of the soil around your susceptible plants early in the season. Okay, and lastly, what's this contraption? All right, I've had to bring this because you know it's all about the pollinators. We want to support the pollinators. We want to provide flowers early in the season to late in the season. That's the bees. We've been hearing a lot about bees. But this is a little house for a different kind of pollinator. Can you tell? Butterfly? It is a butterfly. I mean, those slots are just so you know, definitive. Now, yeah. bees, of course, live in a colony. They build their own houses. Butterflies do not. So one of the reasons we provide shelter for them is just because of inclement weather. Big wind, big rain, butterflies do not like it. They need to hide in under foliage or they'll, they'll hide out in a little house like this, hung in your garden, about four feet off the ground in a sunny location out of the wind. And they will just use this as a, as a shelter and a resting spot. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. Charlie, thank you so much uh, for joining me. When we come back, gardening tips for apartment and condo dwellers. And later, a gift to get your garden started for every member of the audience. Stay tuned. I have like about 15 by 15 and my plant collection just can't stay within that. So you do start to work upwards. It's, it's not only does it give you more space to garden, but it also allows more design elements. just downsized from a house to a condo, growing an indoor or balcony garden can be a great way to add a little color and life to your space. Now, Sarah, why don't I start with you? What are some of the biggest hurdles to overcome when someone downsizes or when you're trying to grow a garden in a smaller space? I think the big thing when you deal with condo gardening in general is, is your height more than anything else. You're dealing with a whole different set of parameters than you would have in a natural garden because now you've got wind, there might be more sun than you're used to, etc. I look at it as it, it opens up a lot of opportunities to you. Um, it gives you, I, I find a lot of times you can start doing a lot more stuff with the annuals and tropicals and kind of work a little bit more with the exotics. Um, I see a lot of people who throw up their boxwoods up in the very top of their balconies and I just wait. I <laughs> wait for them to turn brown, I wait for them to die out. There are certain things that you need to learn as far as uh, condo gardening. It's just mm -hmm. a completely different way of working. Um, but that said, it's, it's a nice mix because you have both the younger generation who are mm. before they get their first home, and then you've got mm. those who are moving and downsizing, like you said. So and it's nice too because you're raised up. You're always in containers when you're out on a balcony. You're in control. Roof. You control yeah. your soil. And what's interesting soil, about everything. balcony gardening is that you can learn about alpines because alpines come from mountains. Mm. Balconies are endangered on a mountain in Sudbury, mm. and you all have a perfect balcony garden. So then, what are some of the planters and different types of plants that work best for balcony gardens? Given the limited space. Well, the, well, well, any kind of alpine yeah. plant. I mean, oh, <laughs> just, I mean, there are thousands of plants that you can use. It's finding them. Mm. Anything that's hardy in Winnipeg would be hardy <laughs> in your balcony. Absolutely. <laughs> really, you want to you go two zones colder. So we're, we're in zone five or six, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. And Winnipeg is zone two or three. So if you pick something that's hardy in zone two or three, then you're, it's, it's going to live uh, in the planter, yeah. Kathy, let's talk a little bit about vertical gardening. What yes. is vertical gardening? <laughs> Why would someone want a vertical garden? Well, it, vertical gardening is what it suggests is growing up instead of growing, you know, you don't have a lot of space 
uh, if you're in a bulk, if you live in a condo. So having a vertical garden allows you to grow your edibles or some, some nice flowers on the top. Um, I have a garden tower which has worms in the center, so composting, you can have that right on your balcony. It swiv swivels 360 for, so you can rotate for the sun and the rain will drain down so you can reuse the water from the drawer if, if anyone's not heard of the... I think vertical garden gardening tower. for anyone who has a smaller urban garden like myself, I have like about 15 by 15 and my plant collection just can't stay within that mm -hmm. so you do start to work upwards mm -hmm. it's it's not only does it give you more space to garden but it also allows more design elements and stuff like that mm -hmm. as well coming on to the market now there are some really interesting dwarf plants mm -hmm. and uh, if you look for them uh, anything that says Nana or has something a, a, a term like that is it's going to be maybe dwarf now dwarf could be three inches or it could be 15 feet so you've got to really know your nursery person who has got some experience with dwarf is a plant. relative term. I have a dwarf totally. elm that's 12 feet yeah. tall. Yeah. <laughs> Compared to an elm, it's dwarf. Exactly. And so, and then what do, we, what do we do in terms of light? Of course, you know, a lot of plants, can they take artificial light as we were talking about earlier or do they need more natural light? We're getting to a point where we're starting to force nature less and work with nature more. From, from controlling pests to picking plants and soil, uh, you know, pick the plant that's good for the light, pick the plant that's good for the soil, pick the plant that can stand the wind. Instead of picking what you want and then trying to make it do what we want, mm -hmm. you know, pick the right plant for the place and then it, life is so much easier. And I'm a lazy, lazy gardener. Me too. It's all about easy. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us are. There's a whole, like, again, when you deal with urban stuff, we have so much tree coverage and everything. One of the biggest questions we have all the time is shade gardening and how do I grow mm -hmm. such and such? Well, I mean, I've done gardens that's just entirely different colors and sizes of hostas just to get the different colors and textures and it looks like a full lush garden mm -hmm. all the time. Same it's thing cheap. is when yeah. you look at all the hookeras and, and it's just there's so much variety out there. You just have to dig a little bit further than that annual section mm. in the in the uh, garden centers. Just just go that much further. And past speaking that. of shade, remember too that to get the textures and colors, you've got to say mm, the flowering in the shade is not such a you know common thing. Yeah. So we go for foliage. We go yeah, for absolutely. great textures, great colors. Much much nicer. And yeah, we, we absolutely. Can't... And lush, like you said, Sarah. Don't forget about winter too. I know we don't want to hear the W word, <laughs> but no, winter is so no. important in our climate. If if you can. Look at texture, which is the most important thing, and then have things that are bold, like Burgenia, mm. and some of the evergreen grasses and, and rushes actually are quite uh, shade tolerant and drought tolerant, believe it or not. And then something feathery like a fern. When you people think, oh, I can't garden in dry shade, but if you yeah. go into the woods locally, it's not a desert, right? There's all sorts of ferns and, and, and gingers and so on that are growing there. One of the things you touched about was sort of winter textures and stuff, but earlier you also mentioned about preparing for bees, and I think there's a real misconception as well about putting your garden to bed. And, cutting the whole thing down mm. to the very basics. Yeah, yeah. Now the idea is that when you design a garden, you should be looking at the fact that there's four months of the year that we won't be able to grow there, but there should be not only the, the heights and the different textures and stuff, but also the protection for the pollinators that we're so concerned Places about. Places to shelter. Yeah. And, there's, and there's tons of every, as it just so happens, um, <laughs> there's tons, as I pick it up by its hair, oh. there's tons of evergreen <laughs> plants that are beautiful and have texture. Right. Uh, I mean, I prefer my natives, but this is Burgenia and it has spring flowers early blooming things for the bees are important. You know, these, these are all concepts that we can harvest. Mm -hmm. And again, this is a super shade tolerant, drought tolerant plant once it's it gets going. Too. Now, Sarah, you've brought, you've brought also sort of a trendier plant that people are, people are going to called a cocodomo? It's a type of planting, actually. <laughs> so the idea is that um, we were talking about condo gardening and also the winter season, and who says that gardening ends mm. in the fall? Mm. Like, you basically, like I said earlier, one of the reasons I became a florist was because year-round I'm surrounded by this stuff. So, um, for example, what I've done here is that rather than just having a standard potted plant, we've done a kokodomo, which is Japanese for a moss ball, essentially. It's not a very <laughs> fancy thing. And literally what you can do is have these guys hanging from your ceilings. You can have them resting on beautiful plants and that stuff. Off. But the entire thing is a living creature. So it's not just looking for a decorative pot, you're actually creating the pot itself out of something living. And how do you water that? That's the beautiful part. So the whole thing is just a very tight clay ball that's inside. Uh, if you miss the moss on the outside um, and then very gently water it from time to time, it will hold a lot of the moisture on its own and it becomes almost its own ecosystem. Hmm. Um, so when people are looking at unique and contemporary designs for gardeners and Condo gardening, whether it's you know something funky or cool, or just to but even to hang yeah. like in a kitchen or bathroom where you've got that humidity. Exactly, just, you don't need mm. much light with with the pothos. And mm. that <laughs> pothos the kill pothos. <laughs> so, and the idea is that basically we can do this 
year round. There's no reason why we have to garden only once a year. Oh goodness, yeah. I bring all my plants inside in the winter and it, it's just heaven. You know, you've got orchids in bloom which are super easy. Um, you've, you've got, I've, I just got a, a staghorn fern which somebody grew, oh, yeah. I thought really clever, in a coconut. Yep. They cut the top off a coconut and it's so easy and I take it into the shower with me and I put it on the... <laughs> so much information. It's a lot of information. <laughs> Okay, well, when we come back, how to use food scraps to put food back in the fridge. Stay tuned. This is a tower composter. So here we go. I'm just going to pull this back so, so you, you can, can see. see that it's started to uh, yeah, break down some of the guys. food. Look at them. Hello, everybody. or worm composting is an excellent way to convert kitchen scraps into nutrient-rich fertilizer for your garden. Kathy Nesbitt's here to show us how to set up a worm bin. Now, <laughs> before we get to the worm bin, let's talk a little bit about vermicomposting. What is it? Why is it important? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so worm composting is the same as outdoor composting, except it's done inside with worms. So anybody that lives in a condo, townhouse, without sp space for outdoor composting or access to the green bin, this is a way for them to manage some of their scraps. And apparently vermicomposting is higher in nutrients than regular composting. Is that accurate? Compost is great. Worm compost is greater. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the major difference it's, it's, between them? It's really processed by nature. So the worms will convert that material into a form that's more readily available to be taken up by the plants. Okay, well, why don't we put together? Get There's together? a couple of different ways to do this. This is one way of doing it. So Yeah, any container will do. It's creating the right environment for the worms. So we, so we require, uh, the worms require a carbon-nitrogen mix. So the carbon that we use is shredded paper. Could be leaves, straw, cardboard, drink trays, egg cartons, any combination of your paper products. And why is that? Um, they just they need the, the bedding or the carbon. Okay. So that's just where they live. I don't okay. know why. <laughs> And then we need to add in um, about a liter of soil, just, just regular garden soil. Whoops, the worms don't have teeth, so there's little bugs in the soil, microbes to help break down the food. And they also need the grit in the soil, so we'll add that in. So we got paper in there. We're going to add about two liters of water. Not quite, just under. <laughs> this is just Bradford tap water. <laughs> That's being to chlorinate it. So if you're using tap water, let it sit out for um, 24 to 48 hours to allow the chlorine to evaporate. I, I ran out of breath. <laughs> and, then, um, and then we need about six to eight crushed eggshells. Worms, uh, this will help to balance the pH and the worms require the calcium for reproduction. So we add all that in. All right, and... Uh, and then we just mix it all up a little bit. Do, 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 do. The worms are 90% moisture, so they require a fairly moist environment, but they can't swim, so we don't want pools of water in the, in the bin. That's a good thing to know. Now, what types of worms would we... Of course, there there's a thousand so different beautiful. types of worms, so can you, can you take out any worm from your garden or is Thank there a special you. type Beautiful. of worm that we need to be using? There are thousands of types of worms. Only four that are optimum for worm composting. We're look, the one that we used is the red wiggler. Okay. They're the optimum composting worm. They eat about half their weight per day in food scraps. And they have, we have worm eggs here. So beautiful. I don't know if you can see those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're to, also a worm farmer. I'm a worm farmer. Up to 20 babies in each egg. Five or six is average. Worms have five hearts each. 800 to 1,000 worms in a pound, which is what we've got in this bucket. And it was what you would have in your container. Okay. Um, and where can, where can someone buy the red wigglers? From me. From you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, all Thanks right. Thanks for asking. All so, right. So did you want to... I, look at these, they're so beautiful. Worms, it, you know, worms have five hearts each, really true story. 800 to 1,000 worms in a pound, five hearts each, four to 5,000 hearts in a pound of worms. It's a lot of love. It's a great Valentine's gift. <laughs> just know the receiver. <laughs> do, you wanna, do, do you wanna add these guys sure, in? Sure, okay. Here we go. So just put your hands like this. All right. So beautiful, yay, look at you. Oh, hallelujah. All so right. So they can just go right in. Okay. Yay. And do we just sort of sprinkle them in? Yeah, or, we yeah? Just, okay. I'm just going to add all of these. So this is just uh, so a pound of worms. They're packaged in the coconut core that, that Charlie mentioned. Uh, we use coconut rather than uh, the peat moss. Now, and do you then, mix it all together or will no, the worms? No, they don't like the light, so they're naturally going to go down into the bedding. We'll just leave the lid off. There is a lid that comes with this, although the lid is a psychological 
barrier, I think. <laughs> There's holes in the top, so worms could crawl out of the holes. But if the worms are crawling out of the bin, um, there's something wrong with the environment, so. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, yes. so typically would you put a lid on top of it? Yes, there would be okay. a lid on top. There's three key elements for successful worm composting, air, moisture, and uh, temperature. So you need holes. Temperature about 16 to um, 28 is optimum, so room temperature and uh, airflow and moisture, so about 75% humidity. Now at this point we would add the food scraps. Right, so the food that we're eating, the worms eat about half their weight per day in food scraps, so it's all your fruit and veg, coffee, tea, pasta, rice, beans, grains, plant clipping. What stays out, no meat, no dairy, no sauce. Mm -hmm. They don't have teeth, the more you chop it up, the faster it breaks down, the more the worms can eat. So when you're, bearing, when you're feeding your worms, you actually pull back the bedding, you add your chopped up food scraps in the hole that you've made, and make sure that it's covered so you don't get fruit flies. If anybody has ever had fruit flies, you know that, but you haven't had a worm bin, you know the fruit flies don't come from the worm bin, right? You didn't have one. <laughs> so um, they come from the fruit you're, fruit you're putting in. So uh, bananas, orange, melon, anything that you don't generally wash before consuming, mm -hmm. right? If you're eating the apple, if you haven't washed it, well, yep, the fruit flies are there too. <laughs> and then how would, you con how would you control for odor? Uh, I oh, thank you, odor. This is aerobic process, meaning with oxygen. It should never smell like uh, rotting food. If it smells like rotting food, it's rotting food and not composting. Okay. And worms breathe through their skin and they breathe oxygen through their skin, not methane. So if, it's like a built-in mechanism. If it, if it smells bad, it's bad. Bad for us, bad for the worms, you need to take action. So it's either become too wet too much food, something's happened, so you just call me on the worm hotline. Now, this is one way of doing it. There's another way that we can do it. There's another way, yes. So beautiful. So any container, that's just a basic container. This is called the Living Composter, made right here in Ontario. So beautiful. So this is a tower composter. Comes with, um, with two trays. Um, this is a, a, an actual functioning... <laughs> this is from my kitchen. So here we go. I'm just going to pull this back so, so you, you can, can see. see but it's started to uh, yeah, break down some of the guys. food. Look at them. Hello, everybody. And can you smell anything? No, so you can't. So there's lots of food scraps here. You can see the food scraps right there. No and odor. And how far along is this one? This one is, I mean, I need to add the next tray on. There's, with, the, with the tower composters, there's holes in the bottom of each tray. Here we go. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> right, so, so it'll drain down. Right, so there's holes in the bottom of each tray. You start on the bottom. So this bottom tray is ready to go in the garden. Look at this. It's black gold. So this is, if you grow food, you want to make your own soil. It's the soil that, if you have good soil, the soil will look after the plants. Uh, so you take, so this one was done. You start on the bottom. When that one is full, then you set up the next tray. The worms will follow the food, so you don't need to manually harvest. And the bottom is where you capture your moisture. So if you, as your food breaks down, the juice gets released. So if you're using a single unit, you have to be careful it doesn't get too wet. In the tower composters, the excess moisture will drain down. There's a tap right in the very bottom. You can t siphon off the liquid. People say, yay, compost tea, with caution. Um, it's a wonderful way to collect the liquid to manage your moisture. If that liquid smells bad, it's anaerobic. You don't want to put anaerobic anything on your plants. Plants mm. always require aerobic bacteria to grow. If it smells bad, discard it. If it doesn't smell bad, you can dilute it and water your plants and have liquid fertilizer. Oh, okay. It's magic. And then, the beautiful part, uh, other than the system and the worms and <laughs> that's made in Ontario, look at this when you have, when you're done for the day, you just sit down. <laughs> So beautiful. Okay. <laughs> All right, Kathy. Thank you so much. When we return, we'll hear from the audience. Don't go away. <laughs> Thank you. I put mushroom dirt in every year, and then rototill it in. But um, rototillering. I was going to say. Don't rototiller. rototiller. Just dump it on top yeah. because the worms will do all the work for you. And so we're going to be starting with you, Ed. Hi. Welcome to the round table. What's your question? Hi, yes, um, I've got a, a garden which is 10 years old and grass and trees. And it's been great for a while, but all of a sudden now it seems like one, maybe it's from the one tree, I'm getting as if there's um, the roots and little bits of, uh, bits of the, uh, tree coming up, you know, little bits of so on. Uh, it's messing up my lawn, so I don't know what to do. Do you know what kind of tree it is? 
Actually, it's a, it's a, the one I think is the problem is a sand cherry, and uh, it's it's grafted on something. Yeah. So I don't what you've know. got is the rootstock that's coming up from underneath. Yeah. Um, there isn't actually a great easy answer for that. You kind of, I might even think about replacing it with something else, and then unfortunately following the roots. Stuck with that root. Uh, really. Yeah. Uh, because it's going to keep suckering forever and ever. Yeah. Um, the lawnmower will cut it down, but you'll still have these little sharp. Bits coming up, and then it's just going to get nice thicker to walk and harder all yeah. the time. I don't often say Removal it's time to lose a plant, but uh, okay. and there's all sorts of amazing other things. You said it was fairly shady there, um, so there, there's plants like uh, if, if you've got all the trees, is it fairly shady? It's a ten-year-old tree, and I'm just trying to think that uh, is there something wrong with that particular tree? Is it dying? No, that's what it does. It likes to make an entire forest. <laughs> oh, it, it wants to oh, It's yeah. lonely. So it's making I don't want a forest. <laughs> okay. Where are you going to have to keep equipping? Yep. As long as you, unless you, unless you don't mind it. Yeah. No, Could you no. live with it? It's got to go. It because it's going to come up in the garden. So the tree's got to go. And I, get a, I guess yeah. I should get another tree, a different kind of tree. Get a shrub. Get something like, like um, there are so many really good like ones around. I hate to yeah. suggest one. Yeah. There's but a new lemony lace uh, elderberry. That's, that's nice. a nice one. Low light. How, I guess it would depend how much light you'd have there. Yeah. Uh, how many hours of sunlight a day would have impact on what choices? Look at the labels. Shrubbery. Look at the labels and, if, and make sure that they're not have runners. For instance, the Roost Typhina is a lovely plant. Okay. Golden. Da -da. They said this will not run. Run. <laughs> so you. Yeah. Have, that's the tiger eyes. The tiger sumac, eyes yeah. sumac, and it's just a beautiful plant. But be, but again. Be, be very careful. Some of the new they, nine barks are spectacular. Yeah, with the, they uh, and they're a native R, which is a cultivar of a native plant. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, be care, again, reading the tags, some of them are cute little things, and some of them are 12 Huge. by 12 foot giants, okay. but they're lovely. Yeah. Uh, they things flower, like Diablo and yeah, oh, do not put in a hibiscus syriac yeah. because you'll end up okay. with the same problem. Yeah, Another forest. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jim, welcome to the round table. Uh, my problem is, is that every time we plant the garden, uh, outdoor garden, uh, some years we get a lot of produce, and some years we don't get anything. An example, beets. We grow a lot of beets. We get a lot of tops. Then the layers turn brown, but no bottoms. That's part of my problem. We thin the beets? We thin them, because yeah. we use, we eat them as beet greens. For the greens, yeah. Because sometimes when you don't get the big root, it's because the, you haven't thinned. So you are encouraging above ground, but there's, the root can't do the expansion it needs to do underground. So thinning with carrots and beets can be an issue. Soil, what's your soil quality like? So I've never had it tested. I put mushroom dirt in every year and then rototill it in, but... Um, Rototillering? Roto I was going to say, don't rototiller. Roto Roto Thank you. That's Just the new dump it on top yeah. because the worms will do all the work for you and make much more friable, healthy soil than rototillering. Roto breaks the structure up of the little part, like the little particles are in these tiny little clods. And rototilling was very common and normal not that long ago. We even went to university at rototilling, but now it's all about no tilling. Just let the soil do its thing. That, Mother Nature has done it for millions of years just fine without us throwing in a bunch of bigger scenery. Because in the fall, mm -hmm. I turn it over by spade. Okay, yep, you can do that. Then and that's more than enough, but just, just the depth so of the spade. So in the spring, I just bothered. open up the... Yep. Um, where I want to plant it. And, yep. and layer on whatever organics, whether fall or spring or both. But you don't need to do this. Think of the soil as a farm. If there's just all that activity in there and you don't want to interfere with it, you don't want to mess it up, it's doing its job. The more latitude you give Mother Nature, the Absolutely. better she can look after things. Yeah. I, I have uh, a little wetland beside my house and the birds come out of there and eat all the pests. Mm -hmm. I allow uh, places for brush to sit and then there's a place for the toads to live and the toads take care of the slugs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's so much easier when you let it's nature cool. do it. You like the yeah. circle of yeah. life, yeah. really. The yeah. beautiful thing <laughs> you're telling you is you don't Break have to do song. <laughs> You can do less, and you'll, you'll well, get more, more out of it. I've got more time to do something else now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Get yeah, another yeah. going. Knitting. Very, very yeah. good. Well, before Our we go... Our brings us knitting. <laughs> before we go, today, every member of the audience will take home ranunculus plants <laughs> to help get your garden started, courtesy of Terra Greenhouses. Sorry, I didn't hand them out. Stay right there. We'll be right back.
On Twitter, Lena says, spring is my favorite time of the year. Although I have an indoor garden, there's nothing better than getting outside in the fresh air. On Facebook, Richard writes, gardening is my favorite hobby. It's a great reason to get your hands dirty. Hashtag garden fever. Sonia tweets about her studio audience experience on the Zoomer. So many great tips. I can't wait to get my garden started right away. Keep the comments coming in. And don't forget to log on to www.thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more. Starting to my left, Marjorie. I think everybody should garden right to the end of their lives. And if you can't do it yourself, get someone to help you, or just enjoy. I love it. Um, I just, I mean, if I could remind people of one thing, it's that we have all the tools. Gardeners have all the tools to fix all of the problems, all of the things that people are worried about, from, from pollinators to food security. It's gardeners have the ability to fix those things, and I think we need to see ourselves through that lens mm -hmm. of, of problem solving. Uh, and yes, absolutely. And share that information. You know, if you're working with younger people, teach them, share that information. Absolutely. With them. Mm -hmm. I think for me, is I may be biased, but I think that you should have plants both inside and out um, and find ways to integrate the, the outdoors into your indoor environment. It will make you a happy, healthier uh, person and, and it brings such life into your home as well. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's all about the soil. So looking after your paper, your food scraps, making black gold, so beautiful. And your confidential documents, so you shred them up, <laughs> feed them to the worms. I do that. Right? <laughs> Identities <laughs> saved. <laughs> Unless somebody tries to dissect the worm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, interesting you mentioned young people and that, you know, mm -hmm. Gardening and, and horticulture can solve all the world's problems, and you're absolutely right. I'm doing a lot of teaching, as I know you are, Sean, as well, and teaching young people, supporting them, mentoring them, um, gaining a bunch of enthusiasm uh, uh, from them, as well as sharing knowledge with them is just such a joy. And, uh, you know, we're always learning. And then, the, like Marjorie, you're right, the garden's never done. We're always still got something to do in the garden. It'll see you out. Yep, exactly. <laughs> it's never a finished project. So it's a great hobby and highly recommended for absolutely everybody. Well, a big thank you to my panelists and to our audience in studio and at home. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you soon. It's time to zoom out. <laughs>